This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Have you heard about this whole electric car thing? The number of new electric cars coming out in the next five years is actually, it's, it's, it's completely mind-blowing, uh, especially now that the major manufacturers have finally started treating electric cars like something people actually want to buy and not just some kind of, you know, compliance car to meet regulatory standards. GM has announced 11 battery electric cars amongst their lineup. Volkswagen has 27 electric cars coming out by the year 2022. And Volvo has announced that they're going to go completely electric with their entire fleet by the year 2025. Porsche, Audi, Jaguar, BMW, Mercedes, these are all luxury brands, obviously, but one of them that I'm most excited about is the Hyundai Kona EV, which is going to get 258 miles per charge for around $30,000. This is a transition that is actually starting to happen, and one of the big reasons why the big manufacturers are finally getting involved in this is because there's been an explosion in startups that are looking to kind of capitalize on this transition. Uh, you got Tesla, obviously, they're the big guys, but Rivian just released their new SUV and pickup trucks that's going to get 400 miles per charge. There's also Bollinger, Byton, Faraday Future, and Lucid Air. The last of those two, unfortunately, have hit some major stumbling blocks and may not ever see the light of day. Stumbling blocks that would be hard for any EV startup to deal with, but there is a new player on the way in the EV world. One with a team of hundreds of engineers working on it, one with $2.7 billion to throw at the problem, and over 30 years of design and manufacturing experience. And that company is Dyson. Yes, that Dyson, the vacuum cleaner company, led by its obsessive and enigmatic founder, James Dyson. They claim to have patented a new electric motor and are working on revolutionary battery technology that might put them years ahead of the rest of the pack. Is the guy who reinvented the vacuum cleaner and many other household products about to do the same thing for the car? Or much like his $400 hair dryer, is it just a bunch of hot air? James Dyson was born in 1947 in Cromer, England, where as a child he excelled at long distance running. What does that have to do with this? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. He later studied furniture and interior design at the Royal College of Art before switching his interest to engineering. What does that have to do with this? Everything. In 1974, at the age of 27, he was working for a summer at the family farm and he ran into trouble with the wheelbarrow. It was just driving him crazy. It kept getting stuck in mud and stuff like that. And he figured out that if he put a ball on there, it would actually maneuver around the countryside a little bit better. So he did that, called it the ball barrow, and that became his first invention. This product was a mild success, but in the process of cleaning up and maintaining his workspace where he made the ball barrows, he found that the paint and dust kept clogging up his Hoover vacuum cleaner, and he kept having to change the bag multiple times every time he cleaned up. And this is how you drive someone with OCD completely crazy. So this was on his mind, and he was out taking a walk one day, and he walked past a sawmill, and at the top of this sawmill on the roof, they had this cyclone system that separated out the dirt from the air. And it gave him an idea. He made kind of a rudimentary cyclone system just out of cardboard on his vacuum cleaner at home, and it kind of worked. So he, you know, tweaking and refining this design became an obsession for him. And then in 1983, after famously creating 5,127 prototypes, he finally launched his G-Force Dual Cyclone Bagless Vacuum Cleaner. Even though the price was many, many times more than his competitors, the improvement in quality of the use of this thing was so much, and people were so ready to get rid of their bags and stop changing bags on their vacuum cleaners, that it became a hit. And that's when James Dyson got filthy. Stinking rich. In the beginning, he licensed it to third-party retailers, but eventually started selling it under his own name and became one of the highest revenue vacuum cleaning companies in the entire world. And since then, the Dyson Company has used their expertise in airflow technology to create a variety of household products, including the Airblade uh, hand dryer, the bladeless fan, and the supersonic hair dryer. Although I don't know anybody that actually has the Airblade hand dryer in their homes. I don't know. Are any of you guys that fancy? And along the way, his company has hired a small army of young engineers to constantly innovate and improve their products. Uh, in fact, the average age of engineers working at Dyson is 26. Dyson has said on numerous occasions that he likes to hire people as young as possible right out of school because, quote, the enthusiasm and lack of fear is important. Not taking notice of experts and plowing on because you believe in something is important. It's much easier to do when you're young. Oh, the energy of the youth. Of course, the skeptic in me wants to say that, of course, he hires young people because you can pay them less than experienced engineers, but that's neither here nor there. 
In fact, he recently lobbied the UK Parliament to create a university right there in his company. They bring in kids as young as 17 years old, they give them credits for work that they spend there, they make paid internships out of it, they attend classes right there on campus, they do the whole thing. And one of the little trademarks of the uh, Dyson Corporation is they give everybody these yellow and black notebooks marked confidential and all their engineers are encouraged to just kind of write down all their ideas in it. And when the books get filled, they get stored away in a vault. This is done not just to uh, you know keep track of everybody's ideas, but also for patent litigation, which it turns out is kind of a big part of their business. Unlike, say, Elon Musk, who opened up all of Tesla's patents for other companies to use, uh, Dyson actually vigorously vigorously defends their patents and has an entire section of their company that just focuses on patent infringement. So, you know, keeping all these engineer ideas in a vault is sort of part of a massive CYA campaign by the company so that they can always prove that they had some idea first. So, I mean, is that smart? Is it sketchy? What do you think? So their announcement in 2015 that they were going to be working on an electric car kind of caught a lot of people off guard. I mean, you know, the vacuum cleaner guy? But one thing that Dyson and his company has excelled at is building off of what they've learned from previous products. You know, they were able to take what they learned from their dual cyclone uh, vacuum cleaner and were able to put that into smaller handheld portable vacuum cleaners. And in order to make those more efficient, they had to innovate new technologies in electric motors and battery design. And so, you know, you got battery design, electric motors, maybe an electric car is the next logical step. Details are scarce at this point, but here's what we know so far. They're planning for the car to go into production in 2020, which is just over a year away, and they're gonna be available to buy in 2021, and they've already secured manufacturing space in Singapore. It'll use what they're calling a digital motor, which is kind of a scaled up version of the electric motor that they use in their handheld devices. The thing is their products use a permanent magnet induction motor, which is actually what they use on the Model 3. So I don't know if there's something significant about this motor that makes it different or better than what's already out there. Uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. He said it won't be a sports car, but it also won't be economy-minded like the Leaf. It'll have a premium price tag to it. And he didn't say exactly what they were going to do, but he did say he wanted to completely redesign it because, quote, there's no point in doing one that looks like everybody else's. Although he does appear to want to kind of follow the Tesla model by producing a high-end, low-volume car to start with and then do uh, more mass-market cars later on. So it sounds like he's out to completely redefine what a car is, what it looks like, and how it works. And one place where he's starting with that is with the battery. Perhaps the most eyebrow raising part of their announcement was that they say they plan to do this on an architecture of solid state batteries. And the reason why that is eyebrow raising is because solid state batteries don't really exist, at least not anywhere near the scale that would be needed for an electric car. So yeah, the difference here is that the lithium ion batteries we use today, they store and release electricity through chemical reactions in a liquid electrolyte. So these batteries have the dual problem of creating a lot of heat, which has to be cooled through a complex cooling system in these cars, but also um, they degrade over time, especially if you don't charge them well, if you don't maintain them very well. The more you charge them up, the more they lose their charge over time. Plus, they weigh a lot. So solid state batteries get rid of that fluid electrolyte and replace it with a ceramic plate. And ideally this means less heat, which means you don't have to have that cooling system, which means that cars running on solid state batteries can pack more battery in there. More battery means more range. And more range means more gooder. And Dyson is so big on this technology, they made their first company purchase ever when they bought the company Satke 3, a solid state battery startup in 2015. Satke 3 is based out of Michigan and their name comes from the Sanskrit word for power and the number three stands for the atomic weight of lithium. But their goal is to create this solid state battery uh, in a way that makes it just as cheap to make it as say a flat screen TV. Now this technology is still in the development uh, at the time of recording this anyway, so it's rumored that Dyson's first cars are probably gonna run on our traditional lithium ion batteries, if the word traditional even applies to electric cars. But on top of the manufacturing issues to work out, one of the concerns about solid state batteries is that, you know, just because something works in a lab doesn't mean it's ready for, you know, the potholes that we drive over every day. The downside of something being solid is that solid things are more fragile especially ceramics. And there's also concern that these batteries can still perform at the variance of temperatures that cars experience. And on top of all that, right now anyway, is the cost. So eventually they hope to get it down to, you know, the price of, like I said, a flat screen TV. But right now it would be $2,000 to create a battery that could just run a vacuum cleaner. It gets pricey. So there is a lot of skepticism out there as to whether or not these kinds of batteries are gonna work out. But, you know, they are working on it. Hopefully they'll get this sorted out in the next few years. Fingers crossed. So if all this has you excited about what Dyson's about to bring to the table, here's where I squash that enthusiasm and excitement. 
the way I do best. It's a gift. Yeah, there's a lot of things going up against Dyson right now. The number one thing is just that they've never built an electric car. They never built anything remotely this size. Now granted, they have decades of manufacturing experience and that's not small peanuts, but cars come with just a mountain of regulatory issues that, you know, vacuum cleaners just don't. Now also in fairness, that could be said about any of the EV startups that are out there. People went and said that about Tesla. Now another problem for this car is it's gonna be coming out right in the middle of a flurry of new EVs out there, both from startups and from the big major manufacturers. So in order for theirs to be successful, something about it is gonna to have to really stand out above the rest. Hence they're, you know, looking into the new battery technology. Now personally, and, and this just might be because I have a lot of years of like marketing and advertising uh, experience under my belt, but I think that Dyson has a name problem. You know, for decades they've been associated with vacuum cleaners. Granted, they're awesome vacuum cleaners, but I just can't imagine somebody, you know, going to a party and being like, dude, I just bought a Dyson car. Now this could change, obviously, if the car is awesome enough, but you know, brand names matter. And it's hard to say whether a customer's brand loyalty for their fans and their vacuum cleaners is gonna to translate to, you know, wanting to drive around in their car. A car is more of a, a status symbol. It's kind of how we represent ourselves for better or for worse, you know, when we leave our homes. Now it also needs to be said, Dyson is a bit of a divisive figure in Britain. He was actually a supporter of Brexit, which was supposed to kind of bolster manufacturing jobs in the UK. And he's actually gonna be shipping these jobs over to Singapore to build this car. So that just doesn't really sit well for some people. Now having said all that, they do have a ton of things going in their favor, including a mountain of innovations and patents that they've built up over the years. And for example, they want to get rid of windshield wipers altogether because the windshield wipers, they can scratch the windshield. They, you know, you have to replace the rubber on the thing after a while. They actually want to use that air blade technology to just keep all the water off of the windshield with a jet of air. Dyson's investing $2.7 billion in this project, including buying a former RAF airfield, Hullivington Airfield, where they're gonna be testing and developing the car. They have a small army of 400 engineers that have been working on this car for the last three years, and they plan on doubling that in the next year. And at the same time, they've been recruiting executives from legacy automakers like BMW and Porsche. And the final and perhaps biggest reason to not completely count out Dyson is they've got an amazing track record of success. Can't argue with that. It is interesting to me to compare Dyson's approach to other innovators like, say, Elon Musk. Elon's known for charging forward as fast as possible, you know, failing big and failing early, pushing technology at a breakneck pace. He tends to kind of figure it out as he goes. Whereas Dyson is famously perfectionistic. He's more in the vein of, say, Steve Jobs. He puts his products through thousands of different iterations before he finally deems it ready for market. And this actually got him in trouble when they tried to do an autonomous robot vacuum cleaner. It took him more than 10 years to get this product the way he wanted it, and by the time he finally released it in 2014, Roombas were basically a household name, and everybody already had them, so he kind of missed out. Not sure his had advanced navigation and cleaning technology attached to it, but you know, it's kind of hard to convince somebody to spend that much more money when they already have a perfectly capable robot cleaning their house right now for a third of the price. It was one of their few bombs. The question is, will this be the fate of their electric car? could be a similar situation. Will their desire to completely reinvent the car collide with the fact that there's a major influx of EVs coming out between now and when they release theirs? Is theirs gonna be so spectacular that it'll stand out amongst the crowd? Or are they gonna be the next Faraday future? Whether this company is successful or not, it'll be fun and interesting to see what comes out of it. These are definitely exciting times. Keeping up with advancements in battery technology is basically a full-time job. And I should know, because it's basically my full-time job. But to really understand how and why these technologies matter, you gotta understand the fundamental science behind these technologies. And for that, a great place to start is Brilliant.org. Brilliant is awesome. It teaches you really cool things by showing you how to think like a scientist, by solving puzzles and figuring things out on your own like you would in real life. By learning things your own way, you understand it better, which lets you sort of apply that to other things in your life. It's like compounding knowledge. If you wanna get a handle on how sustainable energy works, maybe check out their course on solar energy or just uh, get a better understanding of all the stuff around you with their Physics of the Everyday course. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get free access to their weekly puzzles and games. And the first 200 people that sign up uh, for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses, get 20% off your subscription for life. Brilliant's been awesome for this channel, so if you haven't checked it out, definitely go check it out. You can do it for free. There's nothing to lose. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links downstairs. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel, as always, and a big huge thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon that are just giving me a warm, fuzzy feeling because of the community they're
they're building. It's really cool over there. Uh, I want to shout out some people who have signed up real quick. Let me murder their names. We got Christian Bergman, Mark Palagriallo, Chen Chen, uh, John Mahi, Fernando Avalos, James Holmes, Colt Hansen, Wright R, Tobias Gebauer, uh, Ricardo Salusti, M Matthew Lyle, Charlotte Roberts, Larry, Jeff Heese, Evan Carew, Shina Bubble, uh, Umu, Jeffrey Schellenberg, Craig M. Molander, Emil Gajanski, and Mike Nelson. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Yeah. Please like this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, check out this video. You might like that one too. And if you do, hey, hit the subscribe button because I come back with videos just like this every Monday and every Thursday. And it's that certain time of year. If you want to get a t-shirt for a loved one, we got some really cool, fun, nerdy uh, t-shirts at the store. Answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Go check that out. All right. Thank you guys again for watching. Now go out there, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.